Hello everyone. I'm Tiff Bortwood and this is DNA Dialogue, a monthly forum to learn of new developments in health genomics and engage with global leaders in the field. As we come together today uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'm joining you from the lands of the Boonaroo people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to First Nations peoples joining us today. So during the seminar, I'm sure you know the ropes by now, please ask any questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I'll get to select uh, questions uh, at the end of the presentation. If you're active on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag DNA Dialogue and please tag at OzGenomics. So it's my very great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Catalina Lopez Correa um, to the virtual stage. Uh, Catalina is the Chief Scientific Officer at Genome Canada. She's dedicated her career to genomics and has transformative applications in life sciences in Canada and internationally. In this role, she's taking genomics to the next level by advancing the national and global implementation of genomic technologies. She has a dizzying array of accolades and appointments and achievements that I'm not going to catalogue right now. Um, however, she's been a leading voice in promoting diversity and inclusion in genomic studies and advancing more equitable access to genomic technologies, particularly for underserved and underrepresented populations. And this is the theme she'll be exploring with us today. Catalina, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to DNA Dialogue. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiffany, for inviting me. And thank you to um, Genomics Australia for you know coordinating this amazing series of DNA Dialogues that I know is having an impact around the world. So many people interested in, in hearing your presentation. So I'm honored to be able to uh, be here today. I will be then sharing my presentation here. And as you mentioned, I'll be talking about um, equity, diversity, and inclusion in genomics. So uh, let me share here. And I think I'm going to start here. OK, perfect. So I guess you can see my slides. Uh, yeah, okay. that's perfect. Excellent. Thank you. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. So um, we're going to talk today about, um, you know, really making genomics more equitable, inclusive and accessible around the world. And why is this important? It's not just, you know, diversity for the sake of diversity, but why is really this critical um, making this uh, diversity case? So to start with, um, this publication uh, by uh, WHO, the technical advisory group that actually Tiffany is part of, they made this publication recently, actually um, October 2024, and summarized the work that this uh, technical advisory group has been doing around advancing equity. And really one of the key points is, is to, that they made in this paper is that the availability of genomic technologies is still remains inconsistent and often is very, very limited, in particular in low and middle income countries. And we could say the global south or developing countries that have limited resources, that have low adoption, low capacities, and overall that makes that we have low representation of those population in of those populations that are coming from those regions in our international and global databases. So that's at the core of the challenges and you know issues we're going to be discussing. And I am going to be presenting here some examples on how we're trying to overcome some good examples, or maybe examples where we can still learn. Uh, because I guess we're all learning how to address this diversity challenge. But why is diversity important? It's not just, uh, you know, having numbers and having more lights around these maps, but it really all becomes more concrete when we're talking about also health equity. Because, of course, as soon as we have the genomics, we will have an impact in precision health and we will hopefully advance a more equitable healthcare around the globe. So if we think about equity in these lenses of the challenges around diversity, 
I, I really like this definition by the American uh, Medical Association that says health equity work requires really an acknowledgement and reconsideration of all the principles we really have taken for granted in the past. Healthcare and public health systems and society are still really working in this kind of uh, dual system where some people are having access to lots of the developments where other people are by nature and from almost as a principle in disadvantage. So this is a challenge we have around health equity and the challenge we have in diversity and equity and inclusion in genomics is making this health equity challenge even bigger around the world. So this is the combination we're going to be discussing today, how the diversity and equity and inclusion in genomics is making also, is generating real concrete and real challenges around health equity overall. So the global impact we're talking and I have been talking and I think many of us in the world of genomics have been talking about the global impact of precision health and saying, well, genomics is here, precision health is here, we are really now able to use genomics to guide diagnosis, to guide treatments, to guide prognosis, to inform the entire healthcare continuum. But really in terms of genomics, we do have a challenge around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And the objective will be to be able to have like this map, you know, representation from all the planet, from all the globe, from all the countries, all the regions, and all the different populations to ensure that we have a truly global impact in genomics and precision health. So to look a little bit at the history, we, we have, you know, we started reporting these challenges around diversity a while ago. One of the first papers was these uh, published by Carlos Bustamante in 2011, where they're talking about um, really at genomics and genomic medicine for the world. And really talking about the challenges we have around the lack of representation or most kind of uh, challenging, the, the, the fact that most of the populations we have now represented in international databases are coming from, um, are from European origin. So that in itself is a challenge. And we started, as I say, to talk about that 2011. These are the paper, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, this is a paper that has been um, cited many, many times, but it was published in 2016, and really, again, illustrates in a much more clear way this persistent bias we have in genomics, and how in 2016, we were going from, uh, I'm trying to here move, okay, perfect. <laughs> trying to move the, the images of the uh, Zoom to make sure I, I see also my, my slides. So we were moving from 2009, where we had 96% of European ancestries in our international databases, to 2016, where 80, 81% are uh, European ancestries with 90% non-European ancestry, which, you know, you will think, Oh, it's a great development. It's a great advancement. We have more representation of non-Europeans. We have increased um, amount of um, African uh, genomes, maybe Latin American genomes and other populations. But the reality is that, yeah, there is a little increase, but overall, that increase is not making those databases really more rich and significantly more diverse. So yes, we see a 5% increase in non-Europeans. We see that from that 78, almost 80% of that increase is due to Asian um, ancestry genomes. So great, great for Asia, but still a real problem for other ancestral populations like African, Latin American populations still represent less than 4% of the total presence of you know, genomes in or genomic data in international databases. And these, you know, it's not just a genomics problem, as we I think all know. It this brings a very complex historical, cultural, scientific, and logistical factors that really maintain this, as we say here in the paper, is an embarrassing bias in genomics. And it's really an embarrassing 
bias for a sector that, you know, we're talking about an exponential technology, exponential technology that's having a global impact. And yet we have such a big challenge around representation and around diversity and around inclusion of these different populations. Here's another paper published in 2019 in cell where we see a bit of progress, but when, you know, it also depends a lot on how we look at this data. So on the left, we see that uh, when you look at GWAS catalogs and you look at the studies, we see about 50%, 52% uh, of European ancestries, European populations, but that's at the study level. But when we look at the individual level, it's what we see on the right, then we see a whole different picture. We see that almost 80% still, this is 2019. So we're talking, you know, paper published in 2011, 2016, and here we're 2019, where we're talking and talking about that. And yet almost 80% of individuals in these GWAS catalogs are from European ancestry. So a really persisting challenge and as we say, a missing diversity in human genetic studies. Here is a slide that um, Heidi Ring presented at the GA4GH uh, meeting in Melbourne um, just a um, few months ago. And we see that um, when we take into account different cohorts, different initiatives, it's almost, I will say, the same picture. We have all of us, which is this large scale initiative. In blue, we see that a big, big part of this initiative is still of European descent. Even though all of us has been active and really vocal and very active in trying to capture uh, more diverse uh, populations. UK Biobank is really dominated by European ancestry. And then we have um, Genomad, uh, which is actively trying to involve these underrepresented cohorts, but still having a challenge in terms of these more diverse representations. So this is 2024 and none of these databases, looking at many different databases, is really representing our global diversity. If we look at maybe other angles here, look, large scale genomic initiatives. So here we're talking about international databases. We're talking about what are the countries that are investing and what are the countries that have these large scale initiatives? So in green, we see the ones that have these national projects, large scale initiatives. In blue, we see countries are starting, I will say baby steps. And um, we see in orange, uh, an initiative that we will be talking about more in detail, which is H3 Africa, that has done an absolutely brilliant job in bringing, you know, more building more capacity training. That's another of the challenges we're going to talk because it's not just about having more diversity in databases, but to really get to health equity and to an equitable and inclusive way of using genomics. We need to build that capacity. We need to train the people in uh, the different regions. So here we see a lot of um, in Africa and particular Latin America and some regions in Asia and still uh, some parts of Europe where these initiatives are non-existent. So there is no real national or large scale initiatives uh, around uh, genomics. And here again, that was published um, in 2019 and illustrates some of these just uh, not just population cell, but large scale investments that have been made in genomics. And when we look at what are the countries that are making those large scale investments and are mostly, I would say uh, in most of these countries are top down. So large scale investments where the governments have pushed forward initiatives and are supporting these initiatives being the ministries of health or ministries of innovation in the UK, in the Netherlands, in France, in Finland, in Denmark, in Turkey, in Australia, in Japan, in Qatar, in um, United States, uh, Saudi Arabia. And we see that, you know, from Latin America and Africa, only Brazil basically 
Brazil is here presented as the only country that has now a large scale national initiative that is really supported and um, really led in a way by the government or parts of the government, of course, through um, delivery agencies like uh, Genomic Australia or Genomics England or even Genome Canada. Uh, so we actually at a national level see that again, the global south and in particular regions like Africa and Latin America are not really able now to build this uh, important capacity that we need to build in order to make sure that we really get the diversity we need to make healthcare and genomics more equitable and accessible. So why is this important? Of course, you know, we talk about diversity and yeah, diversity now is kind of a buzzword. Everybody talks about we need more genomes, more diverse genomes. But in terms of healthcare, really, why is this important? And here, I think we touch on a very important point, which is the variance of unknown um, significance um, or variants uh, that are really not well understood because we don't have enough representation of some population. So here we'll see some examples, in particular in cancer. And um, we see this study that uh, was published in 2023, so quite recently, where we see different cancers that were studied, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon or rectal cancer. And we see where as the, are those variants of unknown significance coming from. So we see that there is in general, about 50% will be variants of unknown significance, but we'll think about African-Americans having a significantly higher representation of these variants of, um, or at least numerically more likely to have variants of unknown significance than whites. So here, really, these variants of unknown significance have a critical role to play in the clinic because these patients with cancer and if they have, like uh, we're going to see in the next slide, um, genetic testing or hereditary cancer panels that will guide the treatment or will guide the um, clinical care of those patients, if those variants are of unknown significance, there will not be a concrete action that could be taken for those patients based on those variants. So here is another study where we see that non-Hispanic Asian populations have really, uh, black populations and Asian populations have a significant increase of um, variants of unknown significance. So all that to illustrate that these variants of unknown significance are really generating concrete challenges around equity, a concrete challenges around the healthcare system and how we can apply and use genomics more in a more meaningful way in the healthcare system. So again, you know, we could say um, now is a bit fashion to start talking about diversity. We see all these papers where many groups are trying to make active and very proactive efforts. Some of them, uh, I would say, are doing it in the very right way where I'm going to present some examples of um, initiatives that I think are really examples of good ways to bring that diversity. But it's not just about numbers. It's not just about percentages in a database. It's about individuals. It's about those communities. It's about trust. And it's about building a more equitable overall healthcare system and more equitable um, you know, genomics world uh, for us. So one of the um, populations that have been historically more underrepresented is the African population. We're going to talk about H3 Africa and how this is really bringing um, a whole new perspective and, and bringing all, not just data, but helping us build the capacity. So how are we now breaking these barriers and how can we really um, advance and include an equitable and inclusive way of using and applying genomics in healthcare? One of these, um, uh, well, before we go into the, the examples, I want to share this paper by uh, Anna Middleton uh, that was published in The Lancet in February, 2022. And I think she touches the group here of authors, touches on, on really critical um, points that um, I wanted to, to really uh, dig in a little bit more, which is 
the need to build trust. This is not increasing diversity is not just about what we call helicopter research, going to visit some indigenous communities, going to visit the remote communities in uh, Latin America or in Africa, taking their DNA and increasing the diversity in our databases. We have done that in the past, and I think we've learned from that. That's clearly not the way to go. We need to work with those communities. We need to build the trust with those communities because now the challenge is like lots of those communities are not ready to share and they have reasons because in the past they were in a way abused. We use those communities to increase diversity, learn about these rare genomes without really including the leaders of those communities, including their voices, including their concerns, and giving them the power in a way to control their data. So we're gonna again uh, see some examples on how potentially we can do that. So important to build trust, important also to increase diversity in the workforce. And here I'm talking not just, uh, you know, training people in the South and training people in Africa, Latin America and other regions and remote regions in our, in our so-called developed countries, but also in countries that are driving genomics, like the ones we saw that have national initiatives, more of those, in, most of those initiatives are driven by white, Caucasian, European, uh, North American leaders that are not always thinking about this diversity and equity components. So bringing that diversity at the workforce level is also critical. And building the capacity in those uh, low and middle income countries is critical so that we avoid this so-called helicopter research where we go visit these uh, regions, extract DNA from the individuals, and enrich with diversity our databases that are managed and, you know, almost used for the benefit of the North. So I think those uh, three elements are critical, and we'll just discuss more a little bit about that um, in the next slides. So let me, uh, as examples, let me start with one project that Genome Canada, and um, I had the fortune to work with this project. I'm not part of this project and I don't pretend to be an expert in this project. This is a project that belongs to the indigenous community in Canada, but I just want to give it as an example because that, the Silent Genomes project um, was initially funded around 2017. And the objective of this initiative is to reduce healthcare disparities. So we go back to this equity in health. This is not about a database. This is about reducing healthcare disparities, improving diagnostic success for children with genetic diseases from indigenous communities in Canada. Initially, the project was funded in British Columbia with most of the indigenous communities we see here in the map coming from the West Coast in Canada. And it's really, has, this project was positioned as a game changer. Here um, is Nadine Caron, one of the three leaders, uh, sorry, Laura Arbor, one of the three leaders. We'll see that uh, we have one of the three leaders is an indigenous surgeon, Nadine Caron. And this, again, is a $10 million project that started 2017, but it's a game changer in terms of partnership because it's working directly with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, people in Canada. So all the different uh, indigenous groups in Canada are, you know, we're having this dialogue, this conversation, the project is having this conversation with these groups. It's also establishing a new process for governance. And it's not a governance that is defined by us, Genome Canada, or that is copying other governance models that already exist but it's a governance that is really being created by the indigenous leaders in order to work with the, you know, develop this governance for the biological samples and the genomic data. It also is also a project that is leading to important policy uh, guidelines and best practice models. So hopefully we can all learn about these type of initiatives around the world. And finally, um, of course, there will be a database a variant database that will be built, but that's, as you see here, is not number one objective. So um, just, just for the little history here, 
again, I had the fortune to be uh, part of uh, Genome BC, Genome British Columbia at the time, this project was starting to take place. And when we started discussing with this project, they initially, um, I guess, our, our focus as Genome Center, we were like, okay, if you want to build this project, I think your most important deliverable in this project will be the variant database, because of course, we're lacking diversity, we need to have representation from these indigenous communities. So we need to focus on the genomes, we need to focus on the variants, and we need to focus on generating this diversity that we're lacking. So basically, activity three, which is creating this variant uh, database from indigenous communities. But what is interesting is that as soon as we're starting to discuss with the project, what became more prominent and more important for this project is actually activity one, which is the governance and really building this trust and the dialogue and building the capacity and generating this conversation with the indigenous communities in Canada. So, the project was initially scheduled to be just four years and almost like many other projects in Canada and that are funded by Genome Canada, really they have a lot of pressure to start generating data on year one or maybe year two. Here, we have spent initially almost four or five years just on activity one, on the governance, on defining what is the best way to control the data. Who will have access? Who is controlling the data? How can we ensure that indigenous communities are controlling this data? Four years of conversations, four years of building trust, building this dialogue with indigenous communities. So it's not about going, again, helicopter research, drawing DNA, extracting DNA, and building this more, um, you know, th this variant database, but it's about building that trust and building that governance model. And now this project, of course, has had a lot of visibility here. We see Nadine Caron that uh, has done also an incredible job. She's a surgeon, a cancer surgeon, breast cancer surgeon from uh, what is one of the three leaders uh, from uh, the silent genomes. And she also is doing an amazing job building the capacity in indigenous communities, just giving visibility, like this project is in the news, this project, people know about this project in Canada and internationally, because it's really breaking barriers and is showing us how to do research with underrepresented communities in a different way. Uh, a little bit linked to that is um, these new principles that we are now using as core of the silent genome, which is, you know, some of you have heard about the FAIR principles in terms of data sharing, in terms of making the data visible, accessible, uh, interoperability of the data and all that. Here we're talking about OCAP principles that were developed by this First Nations Information Governance Center here in Canada. And they stand for ownership, control, access, and possession of the genomic data. So again, it's not about me going and extracting DNA and saying, oh, we have now 60% representation, 70%. It's not about diversity in those sense. It's about the ownership. It's about the control of the data. And ownership in this case, refer to the relationship of First Nations to their cultural knowledge, data, and information. So it, again, it's not just about your genome, it's about your culture, it's about the information that is associated with that genomic data. Now switch a little bit gears into H3 Africa. And well, H3 Africa, maybe uh, some of you already know well about this initiative uh, that also has uh, received a lot, you know, there's a lot of publications around this initiative, um, but I will highlight a couple of things here. Uh, first, that even though this initiative is funded by uh, NIH and the Wellcome Trust, is mm, really focusing on building local capacity. It's not focusing on north-south collaborations like many of these funding initiatives are, but here is about building the capacity, developing the projects locally, developing pan-continental networks, so networks in Africa that work, where collaborations are not just north-south, but Africa and Africa. Advancing, of course, sequencing, but a very important component is training and is 
just building the local capacity for Africa through a street Africa. This initiative actually was critical to during COVID because it allowed Africa to respond quickly. They had the capacity and to start, they have already the bioinformatics networks, the working groups that were created through H3 Africa to start thinking on how to share the data, what are the channels, how to maybe um, countries that are more uh, developed or South Africa that has more capacity can help and train and support other countries in the region. So. I think it's a great example on how we can build capacity. There's lots to learn. Of course, it's not perfect. None of these initiatives, Silent Genomes is not perfect. This is not perfect, but at least they're showing us ways in how we can go about all these. Um, just here to say that, you know, 170 million in funding, 48 research projects, 29 African countries is a, yeah, and all these, you know, publications and workshops that have been developed through this initiative really show a powerful regional or continent collaboration. So we are not talking north south, we're talking building that capacity, not country by country, which is a bit the case we're seeing in Latin America. We're seeing a lot of great developments like in Brazil, uh, we see Mexico developing a biobank, but we don't see that much of these collaborations, south south collaborations in Latin America as we're seeing in Africa. So now I guess the challenge for H3 Africa is that that funding is coming to an end and there's a lot of discussions and what will be the next steps, but that will be critical because we're starting to explore that diversity. We're starting to explore one of the continents, of course, that have the biggest diversity in terms of genomics. And we need to continue. We need to continue those uh, efforts to ensure we build on these past investments and we grow those into a more concrete initiatives that will have an impact in healthcare. So here I wanted to share really quickly some of the papers we have published um, uh, that have been part of. So this was really trying to capture success stories in genomic medicine from resource limited countries. And we took um, examples from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. And one key thing that came out of that was um, that is, again, is not just about bringing those cohorts and using those cohorts that we have in developing countries. Some of the developing countries have now developed important cohorts that could be used to increase this diversity. But then we need to expand the knowledge in those countries. We need to build the capacity. We need the training opportunities. This other paper, uh, Genomics uh, Medicine Without Borders, brings a bit of a concept that is interesting also, in particular for people that are joining here this um, webinar from low and middle income countries, is this concept of the fast second winner strategy. So it's clear, we saw it on the map, we saw it in many of those presentations that we uh, or, or some of the countries that are not able to have these large scale national investments will not go into initiatives like the 100,000 genomes as Genomics England or the 1 million all of us like the US or other countries that are doing these super large scale hundreds and thousands and millions of genomes that are being generated. They will have to work with some of the more limited resources and maybe panels and limited resources. But what we have seen and what we illustrate in this paper is that some of those countries are able to really move fast into implementation and having a concrete impact in precision health. One example to, to give here is that, uh, just to illustrate this point, um, there was one genomic variant for breast cancer that was discovered in um, large scale genomic study in the US and that was detected in um, African American populations. Uganda, some researchers in Uganda were able to just analyze that variant and with uh, you know their, their uh, local analysis just of those variants, not the whole genomes, not the large scale study, but looking at those specific variants, they figured that those variants had a really important role to play in um, Africans from Uganda. And they develop a really you know, fast and um, active screening process for that specific variant that gave a super high increased risk 
of for breast for patients to develop breast cancer. So again, it's a way to implement in a much more cost effective, um, yeah, no, most cost effective manner these uh, discoveries that we can do at an international level. And here, uh, a book we published a few years ago, uh, 2018, but I, I'm bringing that book uh, here because the four key, I will say, um, take home messages from the many chapters we capture in the book that were illustrating how genomic medicine is being implemented in emerging economies is really um, the fact that we need more laboratories and infrastructure. Again, it's not about helicopter research coming taking the samples and going and analyzing these in my lab in Canada or my lab in the US or my lab in Australia, but how can we ensure we're building the infrastructure and the laboratories we need? We need to train the local scientists. We need also local production for some of the, in particular regions, and we saw that a lot during COVID, that the biggest countries with the biggest purchase um, capacity were monopolizing and getting all the regions, all the chemicals, for the PCR, for the sequencing, for everything, whereas the southern countries and low and middle income countries were not able to purchase. And so developing local productions will be critical. And as we mentioned to uh, with Africa, the H3 Africa, I think is a great example of South, South collaborations. And we're not yet seeing these in other regions like um, Asia or Latin America. We're seeing it very prominently in Africa, but I think we need to see it more prominently. And what I would love to see is maybe starting collaborations between Latin America and Africa, or Latin America and Latin America, and Latin America and Asia, as opposed to what we always think, which is Europe and Latin America, or Europe and Africa, or the US and Africa. So um, here, uh, just a little mention about um, access to genetic testing. And this is a, a blog I wrote uh, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, where you know I was immersed in this world of um, uh, being a patient and trying to navigate the access or not access to um, genomic testing. And I was really surprised to see how how many barriers that I didn't even know as a scientist, as a medical doctor that has been working in the world of genomics for many, many years, I was not totally aware of some of those barriers. And here there is this, this paper uh, that illustrates some of those barriers. And, you know, they go from your socioeconomic status, the insurance, health insurance you have, your racial and ethnic um, determinants. So it's clear and we have seen it and I think it's, there are more and more studies that um, African American and black populations and ethnically diverse populations have more difficulties to access genetic testing. So here we're talking about genetic tests that are already commercialized, are validated. We're not even talking about research. We're not talking about international databases and reaching databases. We're talking about healthcare. We're talking about equity in the healthcare system and how these groups that have a more maybe limited um, socioeconomic ca capacity or don't have the right health insurance or belong to certain racial or ethnic groups or are immigrants or refugees will have great challenges. And this is true for Canada. This is true for the US. This is true for Australia. This is true for the UK. This is true for the world. So I think we, we do have an equity challenge, not just uh, diversity. It's an equity and inclusion and access challenge around genomics. Um, and I will mention just to finish here, um, some initiatives that have been mostly led by the private sector. So um, that are really um, trying to bring uh, and to really include more diverse genomes. And I think there's a lot to learn from those initiatives. We'll see them uh, evolving. I hope uh, was one, one initiative that was initiated by Illumina and they were really um, it's more the philanthropic side of Illumina that were supporting, trying to support um, initiatives that were sequencing diverse populations and um, underrepresented populations. The 
uh, initiative how now move to be managed by the genetic alliance is a great initiative but i think still we we are seeing in cases from i hope where yes we are sequencing genomes from latin america we're sequencing genomes from africa but still in many cases of i hope and other uh, initiatives we're doing that sequencing in europe we're doing that sequencing in the us we're doing that sequencing in canada so we're not really pushing to build the capacity i know i hope is now thinking in how to build that capacity but i think that's absolutely critical that these initiatives are led by the private sector really will help build that capacity It's not again it's not just about diversity and sequencing genomes it's about building that capacity here is an interesting company variant bio uh, is a company that is positioning themselves as a company that is really thinking and focusing in bringing more diversity and doing it in an ethical way and their statement here they say they're commit committed to work in a way that respects the privacy the beliefs the culture the data and the populations they are partnering with and this is absolutely critical so now i think as us as a community we need to be vigilant and make sure that those principles are respected you know for variant bio and for any other company that is now approaching some of these communities and i know uh, you know uh, uh, in my own experience with the silent genomes that some companies are approaching these indigenous communities and the indigenous communities are like well, if you don't really show me that I will be able to control the data, that I will be able to own the data, I will not participate in this study. That's what indigenous communities in Canada are saying. And I think that's where we are leaning. It's not just diversity at all costs, at whatever cost, but it's diversity with a really trust and inclusive you know, um, in thinking about inclusion, thinking not not just about the numbers and the statistics. Here is yet another initiative. It's called the Alliance for Genomic Discovery. Alliance for Genomic Discovery was launched in um, 2023. And I think, uh, let me hear and move. The, the first group of companies that were part of the initiative were Abby, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bayer, and Merck. And as far as I uh, know, and the information we have gathered, most of the sequencing was being done through Amgen, uh, the facilities that are uh, located in Iceland with Decode Genetics, where they have this high throughput, um, and I had the fortune to work with Decode, so I know well, you know, their capacities um, work with Decode in Iceland. So most of the sequencing is being done, again, in Iceland, and is being supported by pharma companies. They are positioning these as a diverse um, data set. And uh, here in the press release they had in 2023, they say that they are already sequencing 35,000 of individuals with African ancestry, which is which is huge, it's, 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 it's important. And I think we need to celebrate, but we need to make sure again that this is done in the right way other partners um, have added uh, to these in 2024 there are more pharma companies bristol uh, mayors uh, gsk and novo nordisk are now part of this alliance for genomic discovery so showing and illustrating how you know pharma companies are now actively part of this genomics world part is not just about research it's about drug discovery it's about developing drugs that will be useful for all populations but again i think it's important to be vigilant and understand and make sure that these are done in an ethical respectful and that we're not just capturing samples to increase numbers and to increase these percentages of diversity and um, the other initiative is at uh, Mount Sinai with Regeneron. Regeneron is a company that has been very active in trying to bring this more diverse uh, group of um, individuals. They created this um, Regeneron Genetic Center that, uh, if you remember in one of the slides that show from Heidi Rehm, they're really trying to bring more diversity. They have still most of the representation from um, 
uh, European populations, but they're actively trying to bring this diversity. And again, here as a community, I think it's important to celebrate those companies that are thinking about diversity, thinking about equity and bringing these diverse ancestries. But all that work has to be done really with the, the population in mind and with you know, this thinking about inclusion, not just the diversity. So to finish um, here, uh, to give some time for questions, uh, I um, really, you know, I think we, we have seen that we have done an incredible advancement in how we are, um, you know, producing genomic data and how this genomic data is really translated into concrete testing that have an impact and real healthcare impact for cancer patients, for rare disease patients, for complex disease patients. We have built regional initiatives now like H3 Africa, like the silent genomes, but we do still have challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion to make sure all of us around the planet can access and benefit from genomic testing. And I think we have a unique opportunity here to bring forward the voices of the patients and just advance education for clinicians and advance engagement of patients and clinicians to ensure that we have a real impact in the healthcare system. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning with um, the Ann Middleton paper, I think it's important to just think that um, we need to be fair and just uh, in how we deliver that. It's not just about representation, but it's about justice and it's about inclusion. And to advance this genomic medicine, we need to engage public and patient, and we need to engage with those communities. We cannot just come helicopter research, take samples, and, and just um, increase our numbers of diversity. Um, and it's important to include these underrepresented groups, but to do it understanding their concerns, understanding their hesitations, understanding what is really um, concerning and worrying them uh, and, and what are they really hoping to get in return. It's not just about us getting more diversity, but what are those communities getting back? And um, that we think that really will help us build uh, the public trust we need to advance uh, those genomic studies. And it's again, not about numbers, not just about increasing diversity, but building trust and advancing inclusion. And with that, I think uh, Tiffany maybe can help us um, with some of the questions and I'll be happy to maybe stop sharing here and happy to answer any questions people may have uh, here. Catalina, thank you so much. Um, what a wonderful sort of journey you've taken us on uh, exploring these issues you know, of sort of diversity, but um, in, a, in a very sort of empowering way. Um, your resounding sort of note about the importance of trust and building trust um, is certainly language that um, Alex Brown uses a lot, you know, around genomics has to move at the pace of community, uh, community trust. Um, and, you know, in order to be trusted, one must demonstrate that you're trustworthy. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of a very challenging um, background of, of the uh, experiences of many of these communities, you know, in order to overcome those um, challenges, I guess. Um, I might kick off, Chair's prerogative. Um, I, I really, so the, that map you put up from the Cavanda paper that showed those nations in grey that are almost like genomic deserts um, at the sort of start of your presentation and then sort of leading into opportunities to leapfrog um, and the, the sort of fast second winner strategy. Um, we talk about this a lot in the WHO tag G about the multifaceted challenges of enabling genomics in these regions, you know, as you know, in your book with George, these four key enablers. Um, and we've seen a number of initiatives that show sort of burgeoning activity in this space on a small level. How can either global genomic initiatives or wealthier nations have more deliberate genomic capacity building and support that in lower and middle, lower and middle income countries without that flavor of colonialism or extractive science? 
Yes, you know, and I think, well, first, I, I would say congratulations to the WHO and the Tag G, because I know, you know, one of the core discussion points, as you say, is equity. And we had, when we had, uh, we were both at the meeting in Manila that the WHO organized, they were really at the center of all discussions was, yeah, diversity, yes, inclusion, but it's really this equity and really how to build the capacity. I think... Ace3 Africa is actually an interesting example, a lot of learning from there, which is, uh, again, it's not about sequencing genomes, it's not about me coming here, capturing samples and sequencing, but training. I think training and I think it's, as, as we say with, with the paper with uh, Anne Middleton, is about establishing this dialogue. For me, and I have to say as a funder and as a chief scientific officer at Genome Canada, if I put my hat of chief scientific officer, I would say it was a bit frustrating, the silent genomes. Like, you know, how come they are not generating data immediately? Mm. I think we need to put another lens and we need to be more patient because this dialogue requires time and requires building that trust. And we are maybe not used immediately, you know, spending so much time in building the trust because, well, we are used of projects that get funded and start sequencing year one, year two, mm. and it's all about building the capacity. Okay, you know, I, I'm giving you, and, and we see it with some of these multinationals, I will say, um, oh, we're giving for free equipment or giving for free reagents, and it's about generating data. Well, we're not, we need to spend the time in building the trust with those communities. That's hard and that's not something we we need to work with those leaders we need to start these conversations with those leaders like Alex is doing an amazing job in Australia building these bridges and and bringing these perspectives of indigenous communities Nadine Karan uh Maui um you know we we we're starting to have a handful of leaders in particular from indigenous communities we are having more and more voices from Africa more and more voices from Latin America now, recently, actually this week, we announced um, at uh, one of the, um, uh, the Relax the Latin American um, Association of uh, Genomic um, Societies or Genetic Societies, we announced the creation of Latin Omics, which is a bit of a H3 Africa flavor Latino. And uh, I think those initiatives that are just starting, you know, from the ground with local PIs, local leaders, will be a bit of the path to start that conversation. And yes, it will be great to collaborate with the Nord, but I think this collaboration will have to be managed in a different way, uh, to you know, different from the way we're used to manage those collaborations. Mm -hmm. And that uh, actually anonymous um, makes a sort of asks a question that feeds nicely into that about how can Latin American diaspora scientists in wealthier nations contribute? And I suppose it's opportunities such as you just spoke of. Absolutely, absolutely. Like Latinomics now is being launched and is open, you know, to receive more people um, as it was um, H3 Africa. So it's all about starting this as we initially, I think we need to really empower these South-South collaborations. And again, when we compare what's happening in Africa and what's happening in Latin America, H3 Africa really created this culture of internal collaborations in the continent and building those training models, building those um, bioinformatic networks, uh, even the data sharing capacity inside the continent. We don't have that much of that. I think Latinomics is the first step to try and think we can do these South-South collaborations in Latin America too. Mm. Um, we've got some international uh, question, people from international uh, attendees uh, asking questions, which is great. Uh, Anandaya, sorry if I mangled your name, um, from Indonesia, um, was asking about public-private partnerships and successful ones in resource-limited settings. And you did touch on the variant bio, the various pharma companies at the end of your presentation, um, but... I think the challenge they have to overcome is just the scepticism that these communities must feel when they're coming and saying, no, really, we're going to share the benefits, you know, with you. It's not going to be extractive at all. Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, like I mentioned, I hope, I, I hope was, you know, created as a truly philanthropic and principled initiative. 
But yeah, there's still like, okay, we need to make sure we build the capacity locally. And there is a trust. Like even, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mentioned in my presentation, when some of these large multinationals or large pharma companies came to talk to the silent genomes, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, you know, uh, how can we sure that we're not just coming here to extract our DNA and not returning the benefit to us? So I think it's a lot of that um returning the benefits. I think some of them are, are really like, I hope I, I and gen, now with Genetic Alliance, I, I really have the hope that I hope will build that capacity, not just um, to be able to increase the amount of genomes that are sequenced, but that will build the capacity in the global south and in the regions where we need to build those labs, put those equipments and train the people and give the consumables and reagents at much lower price so that those countries and those regions can do their own sequencing. There's a very interesting question here, Carolina, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, that's a bit contentious, so we'll, we'll see how you go. Um, asking you to consider differences in progress depending on the government in the country. And Anonymous states that in New Zealand, our government seems to be going backwards in relation to health equity for Indigenous populations. Yes, this is a very interesting question question Tiff and well thanks for, for for asking that question we are actually um thinking about that a lot in Canada too because we're going to be facing an election and it is possible after many many years of a liberal government it is possible that we go into a conservative government mm -hmm. the liberal government you know, we launched silent genomes, we, we spoke, we had to actually mandate it from the government. Companies like Genome Canada and many other organizations had to develop an equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy. So equity, diversity, and inclusion were at the front of the agenda of the, has been at the front of the agenda of the liberal government. Now, if we go to the conservative government, it might not be, of course, they are not talking already in their campaign. They are not talking that much. So I think it's a bit of you know up, but I think you know up and down, up and down. But I honestly, maybe I'm uh, an eternal optimistic. I am an eternal optimistic. I think the progress we have made, like with the silent genomes, with the initiatives in New Zealand, with the initiatives in Australia, we will not completely erase those. Maybe we have more challenges to make it fully visible and they might not have the immediate support of the government that we're getting right now. But I think globally, the pressures are there. So the pressure for more equitable, inclusive and a more diverse genomics and, and health is gonna be, maybe some countries are gonna go back a little bit, but the, the international pressure I think will be there. I think that's a lovely, resounding, optimistic um, note to close on, Carolina. <laughs> we could have, we've got many more questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them, attendees. Um, but Catalina, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation and so lovely to chat with you again. Absolutely, Tiffany. Thank you so much. Thank you all for participating, for your questions. And uh, we go for a more inclusive and uh, building trust with our communities. Thank wonderful. You thank you, Catalina. And thank, thank you. you all for attending um, for the next DNA Dialogue seminar on Thursday, the 5th of December. I'll be joined by Dr. Ewan Ashley from Stanford University School of Medicine, and I hope you can join us too. Thank you very much and enjoy your day.